Sure. All right, Connor. Now we're recording. Um, so, thanks for coming on my show. My pleasure, Dan. Uh, you are a mathematician and a good friend of mine, right? Yeah. That, can I true. say that, huh? Both true, yes. Both? Okay, good. We have confirmation. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess, let me see, uh, I did an episode with my friend uh, Phil Sossaway already, where we talked about some math. Um, and I kind of want to do a similar kind of uh, discussion with you this time, although there's lots of things we could talk about. I, I sort of, uh, you know, I want this show to include discussions of math that uh, are interesting for mathematicians and people just generally interested in math uh, who may want to know uh, what's going on in the world of math. How does it work? What is it like to be a mathematician? All the kinds of things that mathematicians consider uh, and possibly some bigger either uh, philosophical issues or issues about uh, related to the politics or academia, well, what have, whatever, whatever comes up, I think is a uh, fair game. And I hope this is uh, of interest to some people. Is that the sort of thing? Well, yeah, that sounds great. We can, we can give it a shot. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll have to admit, I, I'm not uh, by any means an expert in even what's going on inside of math, outside of, you know, the kind of work that I think kind of uh, feel that I think about, let's say. Okay, so, and then that, that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, let's just see uh, where see this where goes it. and, uh, okay, well, what is, okay, so how about this? What is, why don't we start, how about this? Just tell us, what is your uh, job? What's your background? So people know that you're an expert. <laughs> okay. Well, I, uh, I did my PhD in mathematics at Columbia University, where my uh, one of my colleagues was Dan. Sorry, so you were two years, you started two years after me, but we actually finished at the same time because you uh, went right through and had some good papers and I was happy to stick around <laughs> to write papers, uh, but um, right, that's, that's our, but we overlapped uh, for four years at Columbia. We did. And uh, in fact, we, we discussed math quite a lot. You, you were one of the handful of people that I feel like I talked to regularly about mathematics. So I learned a lot through our discussions. Uh, after the PhD, I did a uh, postdoc, uh, one year at UT Austin, which is a very strong school in my area of specialty, which is partial differential equations. And then the last two years of my postdoc, I followed my postdoctoral mentor to ETH Zurich. What, is, what does ETH stand for? Well, it's uh, in German, Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule, which is basically technical college, uh, Federal Institute of Technology, actually. Okay, okay, good. I actually never, never knew that. <laughs> it's the same school that Einstein attended. Oh, really? Was out, yeah. <laughs> That's something. And uh, and since 2018, I've been an assistant professor of mathematics at UC Irvine. Uh, which uh, which is the which is your favorite of these institutions? <laughs> so you, also, you did your undergraduate at Stanford, right? I did, yeah. Uh, where you were a classmate of uh, luminaries like. Uh, Andrew Luck and Richard Sherman. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, a proud uh, classmate of Richard Sherman. Uh -huh. I think Andrew Luck was a couple of years younger. Oh, oh, really? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you know, um, I, just just out of curiosity, which uh, do you have any preference among these uh, various institutions? Of course, you were there in the different capacities. Yeah, yeah. It's really hard to to compare. So you know, I. I have to admit, maybe it's uh, <clears throat> uh, because, you know, it's being recorded and everything. <laughs> Not sure how much uh, I'm willing to. to oh, to well, to, to reveal if, if in case it uh, someone gets insulted or, or it reflects uh, badly on you, I, I guess I, 
someday I'll I'll have have... To, I don't want to say something like that. I'm, I'm willing to say something like this. I, I like the American system. I think, I mean, my experience in ETH was really fantastic, but my, uh, uh, my feeling of the European system was that it's more hierarchical, at least at ETH, in the sense that it was, there was less fluidity between students, postdocs, and professors. Yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people. Uh, I have not, uh, I've only spent some time in Europe at uh, these winter schools or whatever, where, uh, I don't know, however I behaved, I didn't know French, so I didn't know if someone was, you know, whispering, behind, you know, I was doing the wrong thing. But uh, I haven't, yeah, I've, I've heard that it's, it's more rigid. Uh, you don't just do like me, I, I just go up to someone, some, knock on someone's door, or yeah. use, their, use their first name. Right, I keep my door open, for example, here you see Irvine or a student, you know, as long as I'm free and there's not something I'm really doing urgently, I'm happy to talk. It's really not the way it works there. But I, I don't really have complaints because after enough time, when you get to know some people, uh, it was very easy to talk to people. But at the beginning, it was hard in Zurich for me personally. I see. Well, that, uh, yeah, certainly. What about the, in the language? Was that an issue? Well, the language wasn't so much an issue because um, there was enough let's say, mixing of languages already within the institution that people just settle on English as their go-to. Good for me. Uh, well, did you, uh, did you learn, well, so they speak German there? German is the official language of Zurich and of the institution, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I think everyone who teaches there, after a certain amount of time, is expected to know enough to teach a course in German. But were you, did you? Uh, I wasn't there for long enough for that to be a requirement. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So what is your field? And uh, how, how do you describe, maybe, uh, how do you describe your field? First, like, do you ever just try to describe what you do to like a, a total lay person? Or do you just say you do math or? Uh... Well, uh, you know, I can, I can try. To describe the field to a lay person, and and maybe well then maybe I will have uh, if you the way you describe it to someone who's I don't know an undergraduate or, or someone someone who knows a little bit of math or maybe knows calculus or something if that's if that really helps further it along but I don't know l l here's the challenge you know, describe what you do to just the general person. Sure. Yeah. So the field that I work in is called partial differential equations. And, you know, to understand what that means, I guess we can talk a little bit about what is a partial derivative. I think the simplest way to understand what a partial derivative is is to think about a physical quantity, like the temperature in a room we're sitting in. And at each point in this room, I assign a number, which is the temperature. And that number is going to be changing as I move the point around. And a partial derivative just tells you how quickly that number is changing when I move in a specific direction. <clears throat> and basically what we're interested in is the equations that describe how these quantities like temperature evolve in time. Or- And in space. And right? in space, exactly. How the temperature varies as we move in space. So for example, if you know the temperature is very warm in some part of the room, very cold in the other, then experience tells us that over time that averages out and the temperature sort of becomes constant. And what I do as a mathematician is study the equation that describes a phenomenon like this and to understand more deeply at a, both a quantitative and qualitative level uh, why these phenomena happen. Why what phenomena happen? For example, uh, the homogenization of temperature of an initial distribution, which might be hot on one part of the room and cold in another, uh, to something that's more uniform later in time. Mm. Uh, would you say, uh, is that something that is, um, was clear from the way that the, uh, you derive or, or, or propose the heat equation, or is that something you have to solve for? 
I give right. it, propose that you you see ah this is a consequence of that of that model. So from my perspective as a mathematician, uh, I'm interested in deriving these behaviors as consequences of the model, starting with the equation and then concluding that this is what happens to the solutions. Though oftentimes what we conclude about solutions to some equation corresponds to what we experience in reality. Has there ever been a, do you know of any cases um, where uh, the model either failed and so it was rejected ultimately uh, and, and those cases you probably don't hear about them because they, they didn't live on or, um, or that some unexpected behavior was mathematically derived that then someone could test in, in real life because it was it modeled some physical phenomena and then it was it's a surprise. This model actually shows you uh, something that's really there. Do you know of any uh, right. cases like that? Right, so let me think about this. Um, okay. Well, the curiosity of my, I, I think that probably, uh, yeah, very probably sometimes in, in physics, if you, if you propose some model and it turns out uh, that you either can't do anything, if you can't solve it, or when you solve it, it doesn't show the behavior that that model is, is forgotten. Or uh, actually what usually happens is it, you name it, it ends up being a model for whatever, something else. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you, you, we forget about what the guy was originally trying to, uh, propose it to explain. Right. Um, I mean, I think, well, some example of this, I'm not sure it's exactly what you're looking for, but the, the one that I have in mind is Einstein's theory of general relativity. So he, he wrote down some equations back in 1915. And uh, these equations predicted that light bends as it passes by a large mass, like a planet. And, uh, you know, at the time it wasn't known whether or not this happens, but people could see very clearly from the equations it was supposed to. And I think it wasn't long after, maybe 1920 or so, that people managed to actually test this prediction. So I think that during some uh, total solar eclipse, they managed to very accurately measure the difference. Something the about the precession of uh, Mercury's orbit or something like that? Is that? Well, I think that's something a little bit different. Uh, although it's also the predicted by a theory and this was not explained until his model came along. Oh, okay. So you're thinking of, it, so yeah, I don't know too much about, uh, um, about general relativity or, or maybe I'm, I'm confusing. Uh, experiments. So, so say again what uh, right so what so I think that what what his equations predicted was that uh, the light from a faraway star will be bent as it passes by a large mass like the sun mm -hmm. and I believe that we managed to act you know very accurately measure or confirm this prediction during a total solar eclipse so when the moon completely suffered covered the sun uh, the light wasn't so intense, and so we could observe a star when that happened. Say so right when the moon uh, covered the sun completely, you could observe some star, and then when things got out of the way, the moon and the sun moved along, uh, we could measure the position of the star again and compare the two. And the difference between those two is something that Einstein's theory, uh, I guess, that matched exactly with what Einstein's theory predicted. I guess I haven't thought about that. That makes sense that light is bent. Uh, you know, there's the star's apparent position, and there's where, say, where it actually is. Yeah. I guess I'm not. I'm not clear exactly why is if if it's the bent by the gravity due to the sun. I see why if, the, if there's an eclipse, why you'd be able to see the star. Right. So this was more of an engineering thing, I think. Right. They, they had to wait for always. There's this light bending as it passes around the sun. Mm -hmm. But in order for us to actually perform the experiment to measure it, we had to wait for the exact right time, which was for. But then why, why would the star be in a different position 
or see it seem like it's an apparently different position at other times when it's not uh well i think that uh oh when it's not in the, when the sun the sun will be in a different position and then you can see oh, okay yeah, okay yes yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay uh I, I i agree checks out uh do you know how do you know how uh einstein wrote down the uh the equation of of gravity well i've uh at some point, I read a story about this, which is it took him quite a long time because he had to learn the relevant differential geometry mm -hmm. to write down this equation. Uh, yeah. So I guess anticipating that something like this might come up, I, guess, I think in my conversation with Phil, I was reading uh, one of my old books, um, some, uh, a first course in general relativity to look up uh, that this, this it just said this was the simplest uh, um, covariant equation that was an analog of the Poisson equation of like Newton's uh -huh. theory of gravity, uh -huh. where the Laplace of the potential is equal to, you know, the gravitational energy or something, um, that the, this Laplace of the potential, that, that, that potential should be represented by the, the metric instead. And the Laplacian is, you know, it has to be the Ricci curvature plus, you know, other tensor involving the metric. Is equal right. to the stress energy tensor. That that's that's like that's the simplest. That's the only kind of equation that's like a good analog. And I don't know that there's something better. But if that equation already shows you phenomena that uh, that appear, that's pretty good. Yeah, already it's quite good. And I think that uh, yeah, you know, again, looking at this equation, there are some other desirable um, properties that one could look for. That you see from in Newton's equations, like for example, a conservation law, like conservation of energy or momentum. Yeah, so I think Hilbert gave uh, a different, uh, uh, maybe a, a variational derivation of of this equation, right? Oh yeah, that's I forgot about that. I think he did. Yes, there's this Einstein-Hilbert functional, whose critical points are the solutions to Einstein's equation. Right. Uh, Okay, so now let me not talk about things I know nothing about. Uh, what, what about, uh, okay, so, but you don't work on all partial differential equations. Uh, can you say, what, what is it uh, more specifically that you do? Yeah, so I, uh, <clears throat> I'd say the class of partial differential equations that I'm most well-trained in uh, is called elliptic partial differential equations. Mm. Now you're gonna have to explain that. Right, right, what does this mean? So, <laughs> so I'd say one of the, um, the key features of an elliptic equation is that the solutions, uh, they tend to have uh, nice smoothness properties. So what do I mean by this? Let me say this uh, with, with a physical analogy. If you have like uh, a rope with a sharp kink in it, maybe you made this kink by wiggling it really quickly and you watch this kink propagate, you notice that the kink sort of stays there. It doesn't go away. It just propagates along. However, if you imagine that you have a temperature distribution that also has that sort of behavior. So maybe the temperature is constant, 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 then has a spike, and then it's constant again along some rod of metal or something like that. The metal is, is very hot at one, one point. Exactly. And then cold everywhere else. Then as time propagates, this spike of heat or spike of temperature is not going to stay. It's going to dissipate rapidly. Mm -hmm. And a key feature of the kinds of equations that I study is this tendency of solutions to have uh, a spreading out of spikes or irregularities. Oh, that's a, you know, I guess that's a decent explanation of well, the, the difference in behavior. Now, I might challenge, right? Because of course you you just talked about the heat equation, which most people would say that's a, well, that's a parabolic equation. Right. Uh, you're including this thing, uh, aspect of time. Um, how do you make sense of uh, this sort of ellipticity 
Um, also, I might, I might uh, say that you characterized equations uh, in terms of behavior of solutions mm -hmm. and not in terms of the, the equation itself. How do you know that an equation is elliptic? Right. Uh, it's, it's, even that is a question that I think confused a lot of people uh, all the way up through the 80s. People were wondering what is the right, right way to say an equation is elliptic. Certainly if it's nonlinear, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, following uh, your lead and the lead of uh, say uh, your, your advisor and Mike sort of like sort of a second advisor to me of you seven, I, I also had to give an explanation, I think in a topics course that I, I gave, like what, what is an elliptic equation? Right. Um, can, you, can you attempt attempt to explain is this this is really at the essence of uh, of your work uh -huh. okay so yeah what uh, what is an elliptic equation well i think um, maybe now it's, it's not it's not the speaking, total lay audience anymore right right i think broadly speaking there are, there are two ways to think about an elliptic equation what what an elliptic equation is uh, that come up very naturally. And one of them, I would say, is the variational perspective. So there are a couple, a couple of ways elliptic equations arise naturally. And one of the most common ways is that elliptic equations or solutions to elliptic equations are minimizers of energies. Like, for example, area. If I have some wire and I would say I want to find the surface which has that wire as the boundary and has smallest possible area, then physically what I do is I dip this wire in soap, pull it back out and I have a soap film. And well, that, all, the different, all the different shapes any film might possibly make, but you actually have it and maybe the, hopefully there's no wind blowing or something. It'll make some shape, fills up yes. that wire. Uh, exactly, the equilibrium shape. So if I move the wire around this, soap film will be wiggling around, but then if I let the wire sit, then the soap will settle to a configuration of smallest possible area. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it turns out that the soap film can be interpreted as a solution to an elliptic equation, a minimizer of the area functional. And surface. So, uh... Right. Well, area, yeah, area is your energy here. Yeah, so area is my energy. Area of the, the surface. And By, um, what is the, how do you know, what, what is the connection with ellipticity as you uh, described it earlier? Uh-huh, right. So the connection is that as I, if I add a lot of ripples to the soap film, I would increase its area quite a bit. So if I have something with a lot of wiggles in it, that's not very good for area. Mm -hmm. And so intuitively, uh, this, is, this is where we see that sort of smoothing behavior appear in an elliptic problem. The solutions will not have, will not have lots of kinks and ripples because that tends to be bad for the energy. The energy minimality corresponds in the solution to nice, smooth behavior, no kinks or spikes. Mm -hmm. No, that's mm -hmm. a good uh, explanation. So, uh, so there's that. What are, uh, what are some other elliptic uh, equations or, or phenomena? So this right, is a, so that's the minimal surface equation. Right, right. This is, let's say, my, my favorite example, that minimal surface equation, the shapes that soap bubbles make. Uh, well, one of my favorite examples. And another one, which um, I think behaves a bit differently. Let me try to think of a really good, uh, a good fully nonlinear equation, because that's the other side of things. Uh -huh. uh, and how they arise. So, I think there's this. Um... Yeah. Okay. So, so how about this? The, before I even go on for the minimal surface equation, I think it's worth 
sitting with it because there are two ways to look at it. The first is area minimality. The second way to look at it is that a curvature, if you look at the soap bubble, you notice that, or sorry, not a soap bubble, but a soap film. Uh, the soap film is not going to um, be completely curved, say curved just one direction at any point. It'll tend to be saddle shaped at every point. Why is that? And from the variational perspective, I think this is very obvious because if you have, let's say, uh, a bump in a surface and I could chop it off with a plane, then that would decrease the area because planes always have the smallest possible area given their, their data. So, but you notice that as a, as a consequence of this, soap films are saddle shaped around every point. Or another way to say that is that the, uh, the curvature sort of averages to zero around every point. In some directions, it bends one way, in other directions, it bends another. And on average, the bending is... In some way of measuring that, that bending this way and, and this way, it, it, has to, it has to cancel. Otherwise, otherwise, there'd be some way of natural way of smoothing it out to get to smaller areas, what you're saying. Precisely, precisely. Any imbalance in the curvatures would correspond to a way of deforming the surface to decrease the area. So there's a connection. One could also view solutions to the minimal surface equation as surfaces whose curvatures are balanced at every point. And this is a, a more point-wise way of seeing things. I just look at every single point, compute the curvatures, and ask that they balance. The right, curvatures. this, this oh. allows you in some coordinates to actually write down what I think people from calculus or differential equations will recognize as a differential equation, right? Uh, like right. What does it mean for a function whose height, you know, height gives you the, the surface at every point, uh, you know, for its curvatures to be balanced, that's some equation uh, for that function. Right, exactly. So now let, let's stick with this, think about this idea now instead of area minimality. Now I can imagine taking a surface that's for example, very bowl shaped. And so it's upward curved at every point no matter which direction I start. Mm -hmm. So I know that this is not the shape that a, a soap film at equilibrium makes. But I could try to fix the boundary and then start pushing this uh, bowl-shaped surface up a little bit and hope that when I do this, I get something that looks a little bit more like what the soap film looks like. And I keep on doing this and doing this and doing this as much as possible until I can't do it anymore. Then this will be, for example, some method at which I could hope to arrive at the shape of a minimal surface by starting with something that's clearly bowl shaped and just pushing it upwards and upwards and upwards until its curvatures become balanced everywhere. I see, so uh, you have some way of measuring um... Are you measuring, uh, you're not taking, um, not measuring area and taking a, a sequence to the minimal area, but you're measuring the some quantity. Um, right, which would be, for example, if I sum the curvatures at every point, as long as I, I get something positive, then I still keep pushing the surface up. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole other way of looking at the problem of producing the shape that a soap bubble makes. Because mm -hmm. I'm looking really at the curvatures and making sure that they're balanced at every point. And if they're not balanced, then I'm not trying to perturb in a way that'll decrease the area, but just in a way that the curvatures will become more balanced. Okay. And so this That's is- That's the way you start, start with anything. And well, I guess you want it bowl shape because that way everything, the curvature is positive. All the, all the curvatures are positive. And, and then by moving it in the way you suggest, it, the curvature will always get smaller and tend towards zero. And then you, you hope in the limit, if that limit exists, you've produced a solution. Is that right? Precisely. And this is exactly the other way that I would look at an elliptic equation. It's 
an equation whose solutions have balanced curvature. It depends on the context, what I mean when I say that, but in the minimal surface equation, I literally mean balanced curvature at every point. Right. Yeah. Okay, I, I uh, read th these are two, well, that, that's certainly a way that you could hope to find solutions to that equation. We have two different characterizations, one in terms of uh, you're writing out a, an actual equation in terms of coordinates, one in terms of area minimization. Uh, right. Ellipticity in, in this case is somehow manifest in, in this fact that uh, smoothness is, is forced upon it because ripples are, are uh, not allowed, they're disallowed. Uh, they're, 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 they're certainly, um, they have a high cost in the variational formulation. That's right. Um, I guess they're somehow explicitly uh, ruled out in that uh, because due to the balancing in the... Right. Okay, I thought you were going to try to find some way to fit uh, Mont Jamper into uh, <laughs> this. This right. Uh, yeah, I, I was tempted, but I figured, why not just stick with uh, stick with an example that I think everyone can appreciate. And just that's, uh, ways. I see. That's that's very good. No, this is a I think a good example. You can say these are what these equations are. Okay, so the, the layperson now understands what it is that you uh, look at. Mm -hmm. But what do you uh, what do you do? <laughs> what uh, <laughs> What needs to be done? So what now, needs to be done and what do you do? That that's uh... right. So now, now hopefully that you know the the viewers have a grasp of very vaguely. It's all I really aiming for. What a solution to an elliptic equation is, and what is an elliptic equation. And now we can start to ask questions about the solutions to these equations. So the first question that I ask when I hear something like this might be okay. The way I've described things seems to be like the solutions to these equations are just dream solutions. They're always really nice, uh, very well behaved, nice and smooth and balanced everywhere. But what I'm most interested in is the situations where uh, the solutions to these equations are not well behaved. So what, what do I mean by this? Yeah. Let me give you an example. Uh, so let's stick with these soap bubbles. So imagine I have some, um, you know, some reasonably round soap bubble. So now I'm talking about a soap bubble instead of a soap film, just for a physical analogy that's very compelling. If it's pretty round to begin with, then the soap bubble, it tends to become like a sphere in our experience after a short time and to, to round out, become pretty spherical and nice. Contrast that with the case that you have a bubble with two big bulbs at ends, which are connected by like a thin tube. So you can imagine a soap film, which is like almost a sphere on one side coming down to a thin neck and then connected to another big uh, region. Let's say. Uh, so I can imagine such a shape. Uh, is it possible that do you ever see such shapes? Uh, well, I've seen them, uh, for example, when you, I mean, think if you have two, uh, two different wires and you make a soap film and you spread them apart quickly mm -hmm. and then you quickly uh, cap it off, you can yeah. create shapes like this. Okay, okay. And when you, so I've seen this physically, you know, the guy, someone will dip uh, these wires and so move them apart quickly and cap it off. And what you'll notice is that this, this new soap film doesn't become a sphere. What happens is it disconnects into two pieces. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is this thin neck is sort of shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until at some point this one big bubble splits off into two. Um, is that because the, the two 
heads have, have less area than would be even a thing with a one thinner and thinner neck or what, what's uh... so what's the phenomenon here? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the phenomenon here is that the, the way that soap bubbles tend to like moving is they like to move in the direction of the curvature. So if I have like a cylinder, then uh, it's very, very curved in one direction and not curved at all in the other. Mm. And so the soap bubble likes to contract inwards. And so where this neck of this large bubble, if you sort of look just at the neck region of this large bubble, then that's gonna wanna contract very quickly and sort of split this large bubble into two disconnected components. Mm -hmm. no, that's a, yeah. And, uh, and one could even, so to connect back to the variational, that's because that's, that's the way of moving that decreases the area as quickly as possible, roughly speaking. But okay. So in this scenario, mathematically, the way we describe what's happening is we look at the curvature of the surface. And we notice that the curvature is getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the instant at which the bubble splits into two pieces, at which you know, time we interpret the curvature as having become infinite. Mm -hmm. And so it's become mathematically undefined in a way. Like the existence of a solution to an equation which we might use to describe this phenomenon will have become something that we have to think hard about. The curvature became infinite at some time, so something strange happened. Would you say then, uh, yeah, that uh, in this model, yeah, that, that, that something goes to infinity, but things can't be infinite, that a different um, physics or some, something else is going on where the model itself breaks down? Is that? Uh, right. So then, then I think we have to be careful about what we mean by a solution to so, so your your hope is uh, to maybe save save the model by having some new interpretation of solutions that allows for this. Precisely. And, okay. Precisely. Absolutely. And so this is the kind of mathematics that I think about. I haven't described, you know, exactly the kind of problem that I've thought about before, but this is the nature of the problem. Well, you'll notice that there's a new difficulty in the model which in this case is a quantity like curvature becoming infinite. Then we have to say, let's save this model. Let's come up with a new way of understanding solutions so that we can actually fully describe what's happening. Or perhaps even, it's, it's another question. A, we'll save the model. And B, as the curvature is getting very, very large, let's get a really good precise understanding of what is happening near the points where the curvature is getting big. So not only just say that the curvature blew up to infinity and we had to do something different with the model, but also understand very precisely how that happened. What do you mean by how, how it happened? Right, so understand the instant before the curvature became infinite, what the shape of the bubble was. Hmm. Okay, because it, it can happen uh, in, in different equations. These things can happen differently. Right, right. And so in, in this particular case, it turns out that if you zoomed in very close to the bubble, right nearby the points where the curvature became very, very large and forgot about everything that was happening far away, then it would look just like a cylinder that was contracting into a line segment. So this would be one way of mathematically capturing what this, what was happening an instant before the singularity, or I've used this word singularity, an instant before this uh, supposedly well, nothing happens. Something, something breaks down before something yeah. goes to infinity. Okay, yeah, no, I, uh, I, you're giving very good uh, concrete examples of, of, say, what you'd want to look at um, 
I, I, let me think about what I, is this, is this of interest to, the, I mean, the, the thing that you're talking about now is something that I guess you could say comes, comes from physics. I, I mean, you, we describe soap bubbles with it, mm -hmm. or at least it's a very compelling as a physical phenomenon of something minimizing an area. Right. Um, is, are these things that you study, uh, uh, are, are these of interest to say physicists or, or people who work in, in some uh, applied field? Right. <clears throat> I, I don't feel so qualified because I don't, I haven't talked a lot, for example, with physicists, but okay, I will say um, people who work in material science, I think are very interested in questions like this. So material science, oftentimes the model for a shape that a material will assume is uh, mathematically the minimizer of a certain energy. And if you want to design a material which has certain properties, then mathematically that corresponding, you know, corresponds to building a material with, that corresponds to a certain energy whose minimizers have various properties. And whether singularities or some funny blow up of curvature or cavitation of some material can happen, uh, I think is of high interest to people working in material science. I, I, of course, I, I believe that it, it should be. Um, I don't I guess have I, a very concrete example in mind of that. I, I guess a, a point of um, a point that came up in my discussion with Phil, who also uh, works with differential equations, uh, some with like random initial data, uh, is his his interest, um, was these questions of like what what is really of interest to a physicist. And what is the difference between the way a physicist looks at a differential equation that describes some phenomena and a mathematician? Because a mathematician maybe is, you know, is interested in things like existence, uniqueness, and behavior of solutions, right. uh, the way that you're describing. And uh, you know, the, all the, these questions make a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, as what you'd ask, given, given a model, given, given an equation, or given some variational principle, something that you can attack. Uh, yeah, these are the natural questions it seems to me to ask. Um, I haven't yet uh, talked to any uh, physicists, so I don't. Yeah. I think you should ask. My, I would guess, well, A, a, physis a physicist is interested in first writing down the, the equation, writing right. down the model, and B, deriving, uh, let's say, a reasonably rich family of exact solutions to this equation, which capture real life phenomena or help us make predictions. Right, these are things, uh, right. Uh, Phil also brought, the, brought this up. Yes, these, these are things you'd uh, like to do uh, first to write down a, a good equation that you hope has some, some chance of explaining what it is that you're looking at. And also you have some chance of analyzing it. Right. Um, and that this process of yeah, giving good uh, exact solutions or, or models for solutions, in some cases, yeah. uh, it helps you to see what you know, put some barriers, some some sense of what's going on with with yeah. the, with what's happening there, for sure. So what is it? Um, but I can give an example. So I, I think there's like an example where I think mathematicians and physicists would give very different answers. Okay. To this question, or a good space to, to work with this question would be uh, the Navier Stokes equations, which describe um, water flow or fluid flow, how some incompressible fluid moves in time. Okay. And we'll just a math yeah. So let me, let me just say this. Let's say you, you, you're in the ocean or whatever. An ocean is, uh, let's say, an infinite ocean of water. Mm. And if you stir the ocean, you know, with you know, a big ladle or whatever at an initial time, then the mathematician wants to do is to say, okay, someone stirred the ocean. There's some initial velocity of every water particle everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I want to solve faster, the equation. Faster at the surface than it is lower down. 
or is so, it yeah now now we're getting into more technical details i'm i'm even just idealizing the problem i mean I, i'm just i'm just a asking whether that will be the case if you start it. oh well, okay forget it forget what i'm well, saying well, why don't we forget it let's just let's just stir a cup of water okay mm -hmm. so you're the, the whole the whole uh column of water the whole cylinder is initially uh, circulating right. as you say. Okay. Actually, circulating around. You have some olive oil or water or whatever it is that's moving okay. around. And there's some equations or system of equations really that describes or is supposed to describe this motion, Navier-Stokes equations. And what the mathematicians hopes to do is to establish mathematically, if you look at these equations, that solutions exist and are nice and smooth for all future times. So you don't get the kind of phenomena that you were talking about with the uh, uh, curvature soap. blowing up and the, the soap films coming apart. You shouldn't have that happen you know, with real water. So you hope that your equation that describes this thing doesn't actually have solutions that, that seem to do that. Is that is that's what you're saying? That's exactly right. So something that a mathematician might hope to prove is precisely this, that solutions never develop this weird behaviors mm. of something blowing up in, uh, at a finite time. And this question is, un, is the answer is unknown. Right. And mathematicians well, regard this as, problems, right? Yeah, yeah, as a very central problem. Uh, well, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's just interesting whether singularities could form or not. The other one is actually would help you answer the uniqueness question. So provided the solutions to this problem remain nice and smooth, you could say that there is unique solution as you move forward in time. But if mathematically something like the blowing up of curvature happened at, you know, after 10 seconds or something like this, uh, then the question of uniqueness becomes delicate. And as you move forward in time after that point, there might be two different ways mathematically to move the solution forward in time. And it's not, it's not clear. In fact, these days, there's pretty strong evidence for non-uniqueness. Oh, really? Yeah. Non-uniqueness, so you can, what, what, would that, what would that mean? So in this very mathematical thing, what people have studied is they've studied the situation where the initial data are singular. So they're assuming that the velocity is nice and smooth, except it gets very, very, very large and infinite even at one point. Mm -hmm. And they ask, um, let's solve this equation forward in time and say, uh, is there a unique way of doing this or not? And, and for which they have to have some generalized sense of solution that allows them to start with some Something which is right. Okay. So there's some physical notion of solution uh, where people really think this is the correct notion because of energy conservation, things mm -hmm. like this. And the people have fairly strong numerical evidence that uh, there's non uniqueness of solutions to this problem. Hmm. Uh, it's not numerical. How, how does that? Uh... How does that work? They they ran they they ran it twice and it came out differently. What 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 is? Uh... Yeah, I don't I don't want to get too much into it, but okay. um, what's the way to say it? So people can I think write down one solution to this problem. If the initial data are particularly symmetric, then there's like an explicit solution that one can write that has the I guess keeps the symmetries forward some time. It's called a self similar solution. Mm -hmm. And now what people do is they say, how stable is this self-similar solution? In the sense that if I perturbed that initial data a tiny, tiny bit, then as I solve forward in time, does the solution look like the exact self-similar solution or not? Or does it wildly deviate? And I think what people have discovered is the so-called instability, that tiny perturbations in the initial data I could see. possibly give rise to wild deviations later on. And that corresponds to, uh, say, the analysis of the eigenvalues of the spectrum of some operator. 
So when I say numerically, I think they mean that they, they managed to make numerically some estimates of eigenvalues of a certain differential operator and show that one of them was you know, had a positive real power. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> okay, that, that's technical, that, that makes sense. That makes uh, more, helps, helps me uh, to understand. Of course, I, I really, uh, I've never touched uh, Navier-Stokes and uh, that, uh, it, it, that leaves the world of ellipticity, right? Or, or is that, uh, how is that yeah. related to your? So this is the funny thing. We haven't quite left the world of ellipticity. And uh, well, let, let me just make, make an analogy real quick, just to show you why. The Navier-Stokes system of equations is interpreted as an elliptic or a parabolic system. Okay, okay. I, I, maybe I didn't even uh, recognize, okay, but uh, continue. And just the reason very intuitively is the following. So let's think first about our, our temperature analogy. So temperature has this uh, tendency to diffuse. If you have a region of very hot temperature and cold maybe in the center, and that tends to uh, diffuse out in time. There's an averaging property. And that exact same thing happens for fluids because of friction between molecules. The sense that if I have a bunch of particles moving very, very fast, uh, I don't know, on the boundary of a cylinder, really moving quickly along it, and then in the center of the cylinder, they aren't moving at all, then at a later time, I expect this to have averaged out. The particles at the boundary will have slowed down a bit, and the particles in the center will have been dragged along a bit. And so there's an averaging of the velocity that's happened. Hmm. Okay, I, I can I'll grant that. That that uh, helps me work it into uh, what you said about the phenomena of other elliptic equations. Yeah. Um. So what? Um, I guess the. Uh, Maybe it's, it's not exactly relevant, but I'll just bring you in on the, the kind of thing that I was discussing with Phil. The attitude, the attitude that I want to argue against is, is the one that says, of course, we're not interested in you mathematicians proving such a thing as existence or uniqueness, because of course there's a of course there's a solution because we know there's a temperature. We know the water does something. So what are what are you doing? Uh, you know, trying to prove, it's like you're trying to prove that the water exists. What, what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah, I think that if you asked a physicist, you know, about all these issues we've been discussing with Navier-Stokes, he, he might be exactly what you're saying. What are you talking about? It's, <laughs> I don't see the point of, you know. Really, but what you were just right. was so, so much more clearly uh, precise. It started going to that, like you can see uh, in, from instability, some issue with um, uniqueness or, or that you're interested in this specific nature of say singularities because it will be manifest in the behavior say right before. Right. Right before. Um, I, I guess um, my attitude is you have, of course you have to do the math. You, my attitude is you don't really know, you are, you're not in the, you're not like, uh, really allowed to claim totally that, of course, you know that this, this applies because, because we have a physical thing, of course, it follows this equation. You don't really know that that thing follows that equation until you have solved that equation mathematically and know enough about the behavior of solutions to say that it is a good predictive model for what you actually see. Hmm. And then, and then it's, it's something, uh, that you know, oh, that now that we know that this is a pretty is a pretty good model and exhibits this behavior under these conditions where the where the model is good. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you as a mathematician. I, I think this is very important. But also, I mean, I I think my attitude is also partly that I just uh, I, I'm inherently interested. I don't know. I'm curious. I have to find out if these things happen. <laughs> yes, I think this I like is problem solving. Right. I know this is definitely a part of my, my training. Like I, 
Although I learned, uh, you know, the thinking by which people derived or you know proposed some of these equations in the first place. So at least you know historically, if I go back, I can go, I can tell someone why you know what's the equation of a hanging cable or why we say this is the wave equation for a vibrating string and 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 now look what we can do with that equation that's not what i do on a daily basis you know i take the equation someone already wrote down and i'm like well what can i say about it right what's what's true um and uh right there are all these interesting questions you can ask about the solution that that's actually very sometimes very difficult to get at. Um, now leaving even further behind the uh, you know, late people or people who just know calculus, can you tell me like, because I, I asked the same thing, what are the techniques that you use to do this? How can you answer some question hmm. that no one else can answer? Right, so right, what are the techniques that I use? Uh, Okay, well, assuming that I have found a question that no one's answered before and that I'm satisfied is interesting for some reason. Well, we've heard we've heard one of them. Uh, right. The business of uh, Stokes and uh, smoothness. Uh, <laughs> there's a bunch more. Well, yeah, yeah. One, one of my, okay, one of my number one techniques for solving an unsolved problem is uh, building examples of solutions. So what do I mean by this? This is not solving the problem, but I think oftentimes if I don't know the answer to a question, something that guides me towards uh, getting the answer is playing with a lot of examples. For sure. And so I really try to build solutions to this equation, to you know, whatever equation I'm interested in, especially solutions that have exotic behavior. Uh, so you try to construct some some extreme scenario and see what would happen as long as yes. you can, uh, control it enough to, to actually see what happens, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Precisely. And uh, yeah, and oftentimes, you know, if, if I find it's impossible to build some example like this, then it suggests that no example like this is possible and maybe I can prove a general theorem that this never happens for whatever reason. So I think an underrated technique or a technique that's not uh, advertised enough is the inductive technique in mathematics of gaining evidence for something you'd hope to prove by building lots of examples and in intuition. Well, I can see how that, so you're saying a, a couple of things. I, I certainly agree that you begin to get a sense of what's going on with the equation if you, uh, you, have, you, you have some example to follow. I mm -hmm. really like, for example, in um, this uh, porous medium equation, you have this Baron Blatt solution, this self-similar yes. thing like this, and you know what exactly what happens to it in time. It, Right, it's, and so, and that acts as a kind of barrier. You know, everything that happens, say, underneath that thing, can't go out. You, so it's that shows you what's what's going on. And there's all kinds of nice, like the the simple solutions to all these equations. Yeah, um, you you come up exactly to the next point. That's beautiful. But once you have a wealth of examples, you not only have intuition, but you have objects that you can use to control uh, solutions that you might not know. Mm -hmm. So this is called the maximum principle or barriers. So when you have solutions to a problem, oftentimes uh, you know that they can be used to estimate the behavior of an unknown that you'd like to get a better handle on. So this is the other thing that I do. I use the maximum principle. Yeah, this is a key key technique in in my mm -hmm. work too. Uh, I just um, is it something? Just just out of curiosity, is, is that something that's useful? Can you in in the in Navier Stokes? Ah, right. So, in in the case of Navier Stokes in two dimensions, uh, the maximum principle is the key. Is really important. And the reason is that. 
in reality, so the Navier-Stokes equations, they describe the velocity of a fluid at every point. And so they describe not just one number, but every point, three different numbers. Mm -hmm. But if you have a fluid flow of just two variables, now, so it's just like a fluid flowing in a plane, now you're just dealing with two numbers at every point. And there happens to be a magical way of reducing this to just one number at every point. This is taking the curl of the equation. So if you take a measure of how much the fluid is swirling around every point, that's like one number you associate to every point. And using the curl, you can reconstruct the solutions to the uh, original problem. Mm -hmm. So in reality, it's just a function of one variable. And this function of one variable satisfies a maximum principle. It satisfies a heat equation with a drift term. So this is something, I guess, um, when you're talking about ellipticity, it's more broad than things that to which you can directly apply the maximum principle. You, you can't do that with elliptic systems. Is that the, right. that the issue? Okay. That's right, that's right. You need to deal with scalar problems. So, so Navier, I say, yeah, the, the maximum principle plays a huge role when one is working with symmetric solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations. One way of symmetry being that you, you pretend the solution has no flow in one direction. So it's really two, two directional. Or alternatively, you assume that the solution is uh, what's called axis symmetric without swirl. So it's really just flowing, um, let's say along curves, which, uh, which are uh, sort of fixed on planes that go through one fixed axis. You have like a Z axis, you look at all the planes of the Z axis mm -hmm. and you're just looking, you're just interested in uh, solutions that move along curves on these planes and are invariant under rotation as well. So I'm getting a bit too right. technical, but really they're, you're reducing the problem to two variables. Mm -hmm. when you do, oh, okay. Uh, you said something earlier that I uh, also, I want to uh, highlight that sounded like a general problem solving strategy that I also, came to appreciate in, in doing math. You say, well, you, when you study these examples, what you're doing, maybe, maybe what you wanna prove, you wanna prove that you, can't, you don't have uh, some singular behavior, the equations are smooth. Huh. So what you do is you try to create, you work from the other side, I, I don't know, unless you, uh, you maybe you work, uh, work it on one side and try to take the limit or whatever, I don't know, if you can't, if you could prove it without having you directly, then that's great. But if you can't and you don't know what's going on, then you work from the other side. Try to construct the example that is singular. That's right. Right. And so if you can do it, you, you find something and maybe it's not allowed, but or, or whatever. And, and then you, you try to work it until it's something that would violate the hypothesis or whatever. Uh, and if you, if you get that, then you know, oh, you've learned that, uh, that it is singular. You, you change, your, change your theorem. But that's maybe right. that, but, but that's hard to do too. Maybe you try to do that and you see, well, it's really hard to actually get something that violates the thing that I wanted. Why am I not able to get it? Mm -hmm. Maybe you could turn that into a reason why you can't construct, you know, these these other things that you're these examples that you're building around and they never quite work. If you can show that it really never works, then you've solved you've solved the problem that you wanted to solve in the first place. It's like Zipping right. an overstuffed suitcase, uh -huh. you work it from both sides. Yeah, you go from both sides. And I like it because it's a win-win in a way. That either you manage to construct the example of singular behavior, which was unexpected mm -hmm. and interesting in its own right, or you've, uh, you've used your experience showing that you know, difficulties in doing this can be used to prove the other result. And, uh, and the last thing which I haven't mentioned is the, what I call linearization. So like, for example, once you have a singular solution, you don't stop there. You don't say, okay, singularities happen. Let's forget about this problem. You could ask, is this example of behavior at all reasonable to expect? Uh, in the sense that if I looked at this solution and I perturbed the data at some time before the singularity happened, would the singularity still happen or not? Mm -hmm. so this is 
what's called linearizing around the singular solution. And if you study this, so really now you're studying some maybe linear equation. Linear equations tend to be easier for a lot of reasons. But, uh, but for example, you know, if there were a singular solution to the Navier-Stokes system, I think the interesting question would be, is it stable? And if it was highly unstable in the sense that tiny perturbations at times before the singularity made the singularity go away, that would explain why we don't observe them ever. Mm -hmm. Just because uh, nature would never create a scenario so special as to generate a singularity. Always some tiny fluctuation would prevent it from happening. Uh -huh. Right, that, that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah. How do you know, how do you know that you're measuring things the right way? Mm. Uh, what's, what's large, what's a small perturbation? Yeah. It seems to me that every, every equation seems to need its own way of, um, saying what, what's, what's close, how, when you say, how does this solution depend either on the initial data or, or boundary or, or, or whatever, uh, or how, how is it, evolved? you need um, the right measurement tool. Is, That's that, right. is that right? That's exactly right. So yeah, for each equation, there's a natural way of measuring things. And we could even go back full circle to the area. Uh, the, the obvious way of measuring, let's say, the energy or say a minimal surface would be to look at its total area. Mm -hmm. That's one way of doing things. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring up this example is because so far we've only talked about these surfaces as you know, soap bubbles in, that live in three dimensions, so two dimensional surfaces in 3D. But what mathematicians like to do is to generalize problems like this. When we think about surfaces in high dimensions and we have ways of measuring their area. And we still always use the area as the way of measuring size, regardless of the dimension that we're considering when we study the minimal surface equation. But the thing about it is as the dimension gets higher, this, this way of measuring things tells you less and less. Are you talking about, um, well, you could have you're always embedding two-dimensional things in higher dimensional spaces, or are you talking about oh, any, any dimensional? I'm, I'm uh, really any, but I'm, I'm thinking hypersurfaces in my head. Okay, uh, hypersurfaces, so higher, right, okay, okay, okay. So you're not, yeah. so it would be the three, like the volume of a three-dimensional mm. thing and four dimensions, okay, that, that's what you're talking about, okay. Right, so it's funny, like always, with a, a certain kind of problem, I think there's a very natural way that we measure the size of solutions, but the strength of that measurement uh, depends on dimension often. Okay, that's maybe another a, a theme uh, recurring yeah. in, these, in studying these equations. Right. So I like the area because you could think, you know, the area of uh, of a little disk in three dimensions is roughly the radius squared. Yep. And, you know, the, the volume of a little ball of, is roughly radius cubed, say, in three dimensions. And generalizing this to higher dimensions, the, roughly the area of an n-dimensional disk in n plus one dimensions is the radius to the dimension n. But if this radius is very small, then raising it to a high power gives you a very, very tiny number. So the area, the area should go to n, as n uh, or the n minus one, right? Yeah, n minus one. Sorry, so n minus one dimensional hypersurface in R n. But you can see that intuitively, uh, this way of measuring things becomes weaker in high dimensions because you detect only a very tiny thing. Uh, how do I say? Like adding a bunch of ripples to a surface in three dimensions makes a much bigger difference than if you did the same thing in 20 dimensions. Uh, why is that? And the reason roughly speaking is 
uh, let's say, for example, if I took a plane and I took, I removed a little disk from the plane and replaced it with a semi uh, sphere, hemisphere, mm -hmm. then I've increased the area by roughly the radius squared. If I do that analogous thing in higher dimensions, I have increased the area by radius to a much higher power. Uh, but when it's small, yeah, it can be very close to zero. Oh, okay, okay. And so somehow the area it, it has it doesn't detect these little variations that I'm making so easily in high dimensions. Mm -hmm. And this manifests itself in a very concrete way. It turns out that. Soap bubbles in high dimensions or area minimizing hypersurfaces can have singularities in high dimensions, but not in low dimensions. Uh -huh. Is this, this uh, Simon's cone? Simon's cone, yeah. Uh -huh. And then this is another feature of elliptic equations that fascinates me and that I really love to study, is what's the critical dimension at which changes in behavior happen uh -huh. and why? And oftentimes it's very closely related to this question you asked about the way we measure things. Okay, because I was getting it. I, I mean, I know that you, you need the right uh, measuring tool in, in order to establish that there's some regularity or you know, to, to have some control. You know, what, yeah. what thing can you control given the, given the model? And I'm very curious, how do, you know, how do you know what that is? Usually in the things that I've studied, people sort of knew already how to, how to tackle these things or what was the right norm oh, right. or the right thing. Right, yeah, so how do we know, right? Uh, oftentimes it's either, either obvious from the, if you're doing things from a variational perspective, the energy is almost always the, mm -hmm. the natural way of measuring things. The other way to predict is to look at the scaling and variance of the equation. So if you pick a solution, is there a way of somehow magnifying or zooming in on the solution in a way that you get a new solution? And if you figure out the way of doing that, then whatever way you're measuring the solution will likely share that invariance. Yes, and that's a, that's a good way to look at things. Um, well, you, you've given a lot of very good explanations of some uh, to explain to a general audience what what you do, um, without getting into maybe you know I wanted you to pull out oh like here's the real hard stuff that you do that uh, other people can't do or something like that, um, which is what I was trying to also get out of uh, Phil because I I wanted to make the case that uh, it won't be physicists who solve these things. It will have to be a mathematician. Um, but, but maybe um, uh, in a different direction. Well, so what is it, uh, so what, are, what problem, are you working on Navier-Stokes now or? Is oh, I'm, I'm not working on Navier-Stokes at the moment, but it is one of my favorite questions. Uh -huh. and, uh, it's, uh, it's something that I would like to dedicate time to at some point. Um, how many people do you think work on uh, PDE in the way in the way that you are describing? I, I mean, I, I think uh, PDE is very broad, but there are whole classes of people for whom what this means is, uh, say, numerical experiments on the computer. Mm. Um, yeah, you know or they use very, very different techniques. I mean, something I, I was, maybe we could pull out if, it, if it's worth doing, but um, you know, a key feature of the, the kind of work and your, your approach, I, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you are looking at the equation, equations with regard to their ellipticity that there's, there's as the key structure uh -huh. and not um, say uh, that they are linear or that, um, there are other techniques that people use, yeah. right, in, 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 in special uh, situations. Right, right. Yeah, so it's funny. I think that in any, 
Okay, so the answer is there are only a handful of places in the world, I think, with groups of people who work in, you know, in the specific way that I do on PDEs, let's say. What, and what, what, is, what makes it specific? And a lot of it is culture specific, meaning like, um, I did do very little to no numerical work. I'm really interested in understanding the singularities of solutions to elliptic equations, uh, all, all types of equations. But I think that it, you know, a lot of it's a matter of taste and training. You know, if, if there's a place with someone, a faculty member who's working on this kinds of things, then he'll train his students to do this sort of thing. Uh, sure. And then that will propagate forward and so on. So a lot of it tends to be a bit um, cultural. That's what I mean when I say cultural. There'll be some places that have these people that will have a lot of students. Like Luis Caffarelli has many students. He's a, a real luminary in this field that I work in. Right. He's is he, uh, would you say that um, he is the originator are we, of, a, of a certain method or a certain perspective in, in this field? Or uh, does well, it, I, is it... Uh, I think there are a wealth of techniques that can be traced first back to Caporelli and then from him back to Georgie and Almgren. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, yeah, really the, the heart of what we're doing, I think, originated in the study of minimal surfaces by De Georgie and Almgren back in the 1950s. And also uh, Nirenberg in a slightly different direction. On now, Amgren was the one who had this, um, oh, now it's so, so many years, he has this, had some giant proof of some <laughs> result about singular minimal surfaces. Right. So I think he showed that if you look at uh, area minimizing, let's say, surfaces of arbitrary co-dimension, then, so that they say they're dimension K in Rn, mm -hmm. then they're... Uh, dimension of their singular set is k minus two. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And on this proof of this. Right. And so he, I, I mean, I give him a lot of credit. I've, I've never tried to read it. I, I read that it's just some gigantic thing. But people did believe. I, I don't. I don't know if anyone can really go through it and, and verify. But and yet people thought it was true and, and gave him the, the credit for it. I, I think, isn't this guy Camillo de Lellis and his- I'm just gonna bring this up. So I think that Camillo de Lellis- Makes sense. And of some of his collaborators, Emanuele Spadaro and the others, they, they did the very necessary and commendable work of actually checking this. Uh -huh. I'm not sure people actually went through what Almgren did until, you know, Camillo came along. So this is this is how many years later? Oh, decades. I yeah, dec and, and I imagine they're not like actually reading and going through step by step, but trying to understand some of the ideas and then recreating them now with their own techniques. Right. So my, my impression is that they they managed to simplify many of the uh, long technical steps of Almgren. Mm -hmm. streamline the proof using more modern methods. Okay, this is something I, I heard about uh, years ago and uh, I just want to verify. I... Yeah. Um, but uh, you were saying, I guess, um, I wanna know more, what, what is it that's different about the way that you and your, this, your school works on, on PDE than, than the way that, say, that the rest of the world on, on PDE does and and then uh, what what is it good for ah uh, well so that's the the kind of thing that it's, it's difficult for me to give a like an informed answer on because i don't have a really good a lot of experience in what other kinds of groups the way their approach is are you saying like difference between us and dispersive and wave guys or us and numerical and applied guys. There's numerical whole, numerical whole. people or the people who um, work with linear equations. Uh, I guess I'd, I'd never seen a nonlinear equation until I until I got to grad school. Yeah. Uh, to me, it was well, maybe, a, a no, uh, 
I, I want to revise my answer a little bit. Like, I think that there are a certain set of tools that we've talked about so far, this maximum principle, building solutions by Perron's method or energy minimization, uh, linearization, and so on. Uh, I think there are a handful of techniques that are sort of bread and butter, but I'm always looking for new techniques and ideas. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to pigeonhole myself. So I think uh, if I see a good idea from another field, uh, then I like that. I want to learn it and I want to, I feel like there's a lot to be gained from cross-fertilization between these areas. And I think, I don't think that it's good to say like, we do not this, from, we do that. Not number point. theory, what, what, you, you go to uh, what are you, what are you saying from, from geometry maybe or? Yeah, uh, yeah, from geometry or from, uh, yeah. You know, because, you know, in geometry, sometimes there's a way of viewing things that simplifies the problem quite a bit. If you recognize a certain object as a curvature. Right. And this can really help you out. Or if you can lose, use a representation theory to help you elucidate the symmetries mm -hmm. of a problem that you didn't see before. Right, or find invariant yeah. quantities or... Uh... Yes. Right. Yeah. Or even within um, PDEs, you know, I think these that some people working on dispersive equations, they could do things on torus, on tori with, uh, let's say, a rational ratio of sides versus irrational ratio of sides. There was a difference in the analysis. And they used ideas from analytic number theory. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. so really, I think that there's a lot of room for, yeah cross-fertilization between these areas. It's just, there's an essential that every student needs to learn and grows up with. But, uh, but as I push out more, I'm really looking for, uh, keeping an eye out for new ideas, let's say. Well, say, I mean, the way that I came to this was uh, in differential geometry, geometric analysis. You know, uh -huh. we, we start by studying manifolds, but the really interesting questions to me about manifolds uh, are not the, I don't know, they're not so much about the topology, they could involve that, but uh, the geometry. Uh -huh. I mean, your, our question was always like, is there a way, you know, does this manifold, uh, 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 does this variety admit a metric of constant scalar curvature? Right. Is mm -hmm. there a way of, you know, signing distances in such a way that this happens? And of course, when you ask this, it's a, it's a differential equation. The curvature is, uh, you know, some, differentiated quantity in, in terms of the metric. And right. one of these kinds of equations on your manifold. And, and so really to answer this question in geometry, all that you're doing is the, exactly your, the techniques you're talking about in analysis. Right. You have to, you have to understand the existence, uniqueness, regularity of these solutions. I mean, exactly what you, when you describe even the motion of these soap bubbles, I mean, you, it's very similar to the analysis of say Perelman's, uh, now this is a Ricci flow on, on manifolds, right? That's right, yeah. Kind of analogous equation. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think, you know, the people studying the, these uh, equations have no hope on, unless, they, unless they know how to deal with PDE, unless you can do analysis oh. of PDE. Uh, oh yeah, I really think that uh, yeah, the, the broader your knowledge, of really hardcore knowledge of something, you know, PDEs. This is one field that appears all over the place. A curvature is built of partial derivatives of the metric. PDEs are bound to be involved. It can only help you to know. But likewise, I think to study PDEs, it can only help to know other areas as well. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it just it benefits someone not just to know one thing and say, oh, what those guys are doing is something different and not worth my while. I think being open-minded, it helps both both sides. Open-minded, but you got to know. Uh, uh, you got to know the maximum principle. Yeah, I, I hope so. Do, um, I was gonna. I was just gonna say you got to know which seminars not to attend. Also, otherwise you. Uh, Otherwise, you lose all your all your time. That's something I learned. Yeah, that's that's, that's true. You you have to balance your time out. Uh, well, oh, then maybe uh, um, 
what do you think about, uh, I feel like not a lot of undergraduates uh, in math in the United States learn uh, learn the maximum principle or learn uh, learn about PDE. Is that That's true? That things. I think PDEs is a it's an interesting topic to breach for an undergraduate because I think it takes time to an experience to uh, to fully appreciate it. I think that a lot of other subjects have been so distilled down to like a 10, 15 week course of foundational material for an undergraduate with a set of coherent techniques uh, that they tend to be attracted towards certain things. You know, you, uh, you what learn things. I, know, was, I find in, in America, people really, uh, the students that I see either drift towards algebra, where they learn about group theory and all sorts of techniques related to this, or algebraic geometry, and also uh, harmonic analysis. Learn about Fourier series. Yeah, that's right. If you're gonna do algebra or analysis, or sort of the two areas, I see those as being two threads that people tend to follow. And PDEs is a funny thing that's in between one of the things, I mean, I think it, it draws from Fourier analysis, draws from calculus and just direct uh, attack, and draws a bit from algebra. And Not so much from algebra, oh. unless you can justify. I mean, I know you, you said this thing about symmetries I'll agree with. Mostly that. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I think, yeah, the, my guess is that an undergraduate may be just confused about what it's all about when they say, well, I took this PDEs course and we studied three or four different PDEs and we used different techniques for all of them and you know, learn how to solve each of them, but they didn't seem to be connected to me. And I sort of wasn't interested after that. <laughs> That's it's oh, just my guess of what yeah, happened. Uh... So how did, well, how did you do it? How did you get into this? Yeah, so my, uh, I'd say my entry to PDEs was an interest in geometry and physics. So I, I like physics a lot. I liked heat flows. And I think uh, when I saw one could use Fourier series to solve the heat equation in a physics class, this was pretty cool to me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't believe it. It's like, uh, you're telling me I can write an arbitrary solution as the sum of waves, sines and cosines. It's, uh, there's no way this is true. Like, you can't convince me unless I take a math class. Like, in the, in the physics class, they wouldn't do that, you know, give you the conversion. They, they, you actually, you, you first saw it in the physics class, but, but were not convinced there was something you, you felt they were cheating you with or something? Yeah, I felt that this was not good enough for me. This is one of the things that drove me to mathematics, actually. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Was the idea that, that in physics it was okay to simply, uh, you know, I don't think I necessarily thought it was okay. They only had so much time in the class and this wasn't their focus. Yeah. But this, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I had to find a reason why every solution could be represented this way and why qualitatively the behavior of solutions was captured by this. Yeah, I guess in my own history, I had had this earlier exposure to some of these, some of this math. And I uh -huh. had this book by uh, Stein and Shikarchi uh, uh -huh. already before I, I went, went to college. So I was already primed to think in a, in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, when, when, I, when I took physics and I, I could, I was, I saw that the professor was you know not treating it the way I would, and then and then I saw he, he was going to say something that's actually false <laughs> when it comes to this point. But yeah, I, I always I, I need it. It's not like I don't like physics. I, that, that's something I, I really also was in, interested in. It's it's just uh, I also had that mathematical way of uh, that mathematical need or a di different kind of uh, certainty maybe or, or an interest in a different way of looking at the problem. Yeah, that's right. I think I think that we share this completely. This is one I discovered. I think I had more of the mindset of a mathematician. But, uh, I was more interested, yeah, in this question, like I, I need to figure out why this works. What one of these series converge and not? Uh, 
for example, I don't know, I was interested in things like the existence of you know, functions which are everywhere, uh, whatever, continuous, but nowhere differentiable. And uh, at first I was just curious mathematically, but then you see them come up in the Brownian motion. They will, this is relevant, really, and it comes up. So, so. I guess I, I, think I is, came from physics is my- uh, I see, okay. Yeah. Because yes, once once you have that, you have a lot of impetus. I actually worry a little bit about some of these, um, some students taking math who do not learn another thing. Mm. Because it's somehow, if you do that, I, I feel like you don't have your feet on the ground or, or a, a sense of a problem that is of, of some interest either to someone or, or you know, has some other driving force behind it. It's sort of like you don't, you might be in the clouds. That's uh, right. Yet. Um, and so once, yeah, I mean, any, uh, you do physics or, or basically anything where you're describing stuff in the world, all, all the functions that we have in, in the world come to us through the differential equations that they satisfy. That's right. There's no, no the equation was one of my first ones. The other one was uh, this, uh, you know, the calculus of variations. The other thing that I saw in physics was the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just natural, very natural to me to view a problem like minimal surfaces coming from this background. So, but then you're right that there's this, um, you know, undergraduates, if they, if they choose to, there is this course on, on PDE. Yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll learn about some of these equations. I guess uh, really uh, PDE, this, the study of PDE was really, phenomenon you could say of late, if, if, if it's in the 18th century, it's the late 18th century that this is getting mm -hmm. started and, and really in the 19th century, and, um, the heat equation, wave equation and uh, Laplace equation. Um, yeah. th these are these models that the first ones that people were able to make some headway with. But I, there's probably a, a big leap at some point uh, as, as you say, you can see these as um, you learn a couple of different, seemingly very different techniques yeah. for these equations. And um, being able to, to really work on modern PDE is, uh, what, what is the path? What, what are the, what, maybe what's, what's the obstacle? I, I mean, as soon as you, somehow uh, taking away, as soon as you um, take away the, the perfection of, a, of a, say the perfect model with no, all constant terms and they're all, you know, one, one, or, you know and it's, uh, there's no lower order stuff and it's completely linear. Yeah. Once you move into, well, what, what does a real equation look like? And suddenly, suddenly it's very different, or at least the, the techniques are different from the ones that you first learned. Do you do you see? Is that right? I uh, yeah, to to an extent. Especially, I mean, but the I think theory are... build up a lot of the same way. You have to learn how to how to make those first tools work. Yes, and you you understand a lot of times. And a lot of times, what I do if I'm dealing with some something new, a new equation, is I find a model that's a bit more familiar, or that I find like have an attack on. And then once I have a handle on the model equation or whatever that is, then that's a stepping stone to the next thing. I see. Uh, here, I'm just, uh, I'm saying, I know it was hard for me to take uh, th this step. I, I um, like I had had a course out of uh, Evans's book. Yeah. This very standard uh, graduate PDE textbook that covers these equations. But only the first half of that book. I didn't actually go into uh, the second half of that book. But um, to really work and understand that this theory, it, it was, first of all, you, you suddenly need to rely on, a, in, in so, certainly in some cases, some very uh, technical aspects of um, real analysis. Yes. Um, and, and there's just, uh, I, I don't know the, the the various estimates that you that you prove which is not a, a feature of probably um, the undergraduate uh, in, instruction in, in PDE. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for someone who's not coming from physics and therefore has some geometric or physical, I don't know, interest in learning these things, I, I think a natural way that the PDE should come into the subject, they should be weaved in to various courses as, I mean, a lot of techniques were built to solve PDEs or to understand their solutions. And PDEs, a PDE is written down because it's interesting for some reason or another, typically physics or geometry or economics. So when you're learning, I don't know, singular integral analysis and harmonic analysis, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that's the point. Before you say anything, you say a lot of these techniques were built to solve the Laplace equation or to look at Poisson's equation, Laplace U equals F. All these harmonic analysis estimates that we're doing, they're designed to handle this problem. This is this is a course. This is something that uh, a lot of students do at uh, UC Irvine. Oh no, no, not at Irvine. Oh, in a graduate course on harmonic analysis. Uh huh. I, I thought you were referring. And I, I think this is a very. This is what you were saying uh, that in a not course so on real analysis, uh -huh. and in general, that the the whole point. But this is something yeah. I emphasize, like, why should a student, why should a student in real analysis, you, you teach these students this uh, arzella Ascoli theorem. Yeah. Which is somehow this foundational, I, to, I, I hesitate to even call it a tool because it is somehow the whole, the, it, it establishes why you would want to prove any of these things. Uh, how, how do you establish that there's a solution by taking a limit? Um, exactly. So what why, why would you teach these, why, why, why do you, so many students learn this theorem and they, they've never even seen an equation. Yeah. They've never seen well, that they want to solve anything. When I teach power series and also Arzela Scoli, like I did this past quarter from a real analysis undergraduate course, mm -hmm. uh, I use both to solve ordinary differential equations. Right. So I really, I use that as a motivator for developing the theory. Uh, and I right, think that a lot of times PDEs can be used as a motivator for developing a theory in undergraduate uh, classes. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, what uh, do you? Um, are there applications? I, I and mean, you said a little bit about these singularities, but uh, that you that you look at, and they're all uniqueness. But are, are there uh, actual? I, I mean, are, are there applications that a person in the, uh, I don't know, the commercial world or uh, who who will see the the benefit from knowing some more about PDE? Right. I. I mean, I think this is one of the things that I sort of uh, just have faith in, you know, in the sense that, uh, what do I say? You know, PDEs is somehow very closely tied to reality in some way. I forget about all of that when I'm actually working on the shapes of minimal surfaces or something like this. But uh, I think that there's value in it regardless. And down the road, these ideas will have real world relevance, well, there's a good chance at least. Oh, I've always, yeah, I've always uh, heard that and uh, believed in that. Of course, yeah. now I'm actually, you know, I have to write a small business grant and uh -huh. uh, that's a different, you know, you have to explain a different kind of application that has to be there. But um, uh, so so is it, are you saying, by, by saying that, uh, essentially you're saying, you don't, have, you don't worry, uh, you, that's not, uh, worry, no. it's not a, um, there, or it's not obvious what the, um, what will be the, what you'll be able to do as a result. And yet, uh, isn't it true that um, see, some of these people, I guess I don't know, I don't know exactly Caffarelli's background, but I heard some about uh, either Calderon and Zygmunt, that, that some of these people were engineers, and um, we're trying to do something, uh -huh. right? Or am I, 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 some, I don't have all my history. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't have my, uh, I have to go back further before I find someone like that. And, you know, like these guys like Mange back in the day, they were uh -huh. 
legitimate engineers who were mathematicians at the same time. And they were solving urgent real world problems using new mathematics. Did Monge solve an urgent uh, real world application with, with uh, transport or? Uh... Well, I, uh, the story goes that he needed to fortify the walls of Paris for Napoleon. Oh, really? And mm -hmm. this was a transport problem from the quarries to where the walls were being built. Hmm. And so he had to, he cast it as this, you know, minimizing cost of transport problem and then uh, solved it. Uh, oh, that, that's interesting. I guess I don't know, I don't know that story. Um, do you have a, do you have a favorite mathematician or favorite, oh. favorite uh, I don't know if you did, do you, is that a thing? Favorite mathematician. Uh, I, I'm not sure I have just one, uh, just one favorite uh, mathematician. I think that my, my favorite changes with time and taste. Sure, I'm going to name uh, a few. A few of my favorites, yeah. We, we can go like try to go chronologically. I, I think Archimedes was. Uh, you know. I have a lot of, lot of respect for Archimedes. I think he's the, he was the first analyst. That's right. First person to make you know, detailed comparisons. And to integrate also. That's right. He has this beautiful result that uh, the area of uh, a cylinder, the same as the area of the sphere that you project on uh, horizontally. Yeah. It's nice. Well, also, I, I like his estimate of pi. Yes, that's right. He, he was a true great. I think he's very inspiring. Um, <clears throat> who else do I really like? I really think. Um, Guys like, uh, of course, Isaac Newton developing the calculus. It's much later. It's a big jump. Oh, you're just naming. You're just naming real giants. I, I, I was, um, I, I was trying to see if there was someone uh, more specifically related to uh, to the kind of work that you do. But if, if oh yeah, the kind of work that I do. If we're going to get to the the real influencers of my work, I really think uh, there's of course my advisor and his advisor Ovidio and Caffarelli. So, well, Caffarelli, I think, really had this, uh, this school of mathematics that I was very influenced by. Yeah. And before him, I think the origins are De Giorgi in the school in Pisa. So I think indirectly, De Giorgi's techniques really have tremendously impacted. Which I know, I know less about, and I don't know the, um, their origin. Uh, what was the development um, before him? I know this yeah. the Georgi Nash Moser theorem. That's a big one. Very, yeah. very impressive to me. Uh, so um, I, I don't know whether their work was coming out of some some ideas before. Yeah, but to me, the Georgi seems like a, a real originator. Hmm. He, he, he was the uh, big big time. This, calculus of variations and minimal surfaces. So I really think a lot of it can be traced to him. Uh, of course, I think Nirenberg on the, the non-divergent side or on the more balancing of curvature setting, Nirenberg and uh, Krilov and Safanov have been big influences. And uh, Vladimir Shverak. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. On the calculus of variations and on fluid dynamics. I don't know much about fluids. I'm only just now trying to get more into it. But certainly his works, earlier works on calculus of variations had a big impact on me. He was the one who came and, and gave a talk where he, he showed that he took a ping pong ball and the blow dryer, right? That's right, yeah. Right, right. and. Um, so he discussed that that example. So that this was really a uh, fascinating. I mean, I should. I don't have a blow dryer, but he took the ping pong ball and he put it on top of a blow dryer. Turned the blow dryer on. The ping pong ball is, uh, you know, just floating on top of it. And he's like, "Well, why does this happen?" And he turns turns the blow dryer slightly, and the ping pong ball is still See, floating here. It doesn't fall. It doesn't fall down, even though this is at a diagonal. Right. Um, 
Well, yeah, this is so remarkable because I think the axisymmetric solutions of Navier-Stokes, they have maxima of pressure along that axis. So that's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to be unstable. Mm -hmm. But. Uh -huh. uh, and he also mentioned another example is supposing you uh, solutions. you took uh, you you took a cylinder a cylinder of water, but the two the top half the, of the metal ring are on the outside and the bottom half were disconnected and could spin independently and they this one rotates this way very quickly and this one rotates the other way. Right. What happens? What happens to the water in between? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, this is huge because I think it's a um, it's like a model scenario for blow up for the incompressible Euler equations, which is a huge open problem in fluid dynamics. The finite time blow up for incompressible Euler, this will be at the boundary. But I think if you consider Euler with exactly the symmetry of sort of oppositely twisting uh, cylinders, it's like a very promising scenario for finite time blow up at the boundary. Has there been any, I forget what year that was that he, he mentioned that. Has there been any any progress? Um, uh, I should look at the, I'm certain people have been working on it intensely. I'm not sure what the most up-to-date uh, results are though. Um, all right, and what can we, uh, what can we expect of, uh, of, of you? <laughs> What's uh, be your great result? I mean, so look, you, uh, the guy you were working with, uh, Figali got a Fields Medal. Oh yeah, Alessio. Yeah, he won the Fields Medal in 2018. That's right, and he was uh, my postdoctoral mentor. And Austin for one year and then ETH Zurich for two. Yeah, so what is uh, it's in for me? I'm not, I'm not sure what, uh, if, if that'll rub off on me. You know, I think mathematicians, they, uh, of course, I would like recognitions, but you know, it's not the reason we do it. I guess I was, I didn't mean uh, to talk about recognition. I actually was sort of asking, what, what, what's your, gonna be your uh, big result or what are you uh, working on? Right, what's gonna be my, my big result? Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated in a lot of things uh, still in elliptic equations. I feel there's a lot to be understood about singularities of minimal surfaces. Really, so even, that, even of minimal uh, surfaces? Even of minimal surfaces, yeah. Uh, like what? Uh, there, there are even very basic questions like, um, so what's, what's one of my favorites? So one of my favorites that I'm working on now with the collaborator Lucas Bolauer in San Diego is, is, does there exist a minimal hypersurface with an isolated singularity? So it's smooth away from a single point, but when you zoom in on this point, uh, you know, there exists a tangent cone, that's the monotonicity formula. Is it possible for this tangent cone to have a line of singularity? Okay, this, this is uh What's more, I guess this is not like the big question I hope to answer that's gonna bring uh, fame and fortune, but I think there are lots of very interesting questions like this that I still hope to answer. Dream, as far as dream questions go, of course I'd love to solve Navier-Stokes. That's something that I, in the coming years, tend to devote more and more time to just, uh, thinking and learning about. That's... Uh, um, has there been any progress in uh, fourth order equations, fourth order right. elliptic right. equations? And also, uh, I don't know, can you, what is ellipticity the same thing for fourth right. order? There's a, a, whole, a whole other notion of ellipticity one has to consider. Now we're getting to the, you know, the symbol and what is that? Yeah. Well, that, but that's something that's been a curiosity of, of mine for a while, but I put that away. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure um, right about that direction so much. All I right. think, yeah, I think I'll, I'll say I'll say this. My feeling about elliptic equations and minimal surfaces is that there are many 
unanswered problems that are challenging. I'm not sure they're the kind of thing that would give someone uh, widespread recognition in uh, society. In society, uh, I mean, in math, it's so it's so um, easy to forget. You you just want the recognition of your your colleagues, and you forget <laughs> that this might be, you know, 10, 50, 50 people, hundred people. If it's if, you know, maybe a, a bunch more if uh, it's big enough that other people outside your field have to have to acknowledge it, and they, and they in all likelihood they won't bother to uh, understand it. Right. Um, right. I still have, yeah, I'm still quite interested in many of these. Uh, but but my feeling is that the field of elliptic PDEs has sort of has had a heyday uh, in terms of a big burgeoning of quest, like big open problems that were solved uh, using elliptic equations like this Kalabi Yao problem mm -hmm. and uh, Maget Pair equation was a big one back in the 80s. And then we'll have to wait some time before the next wave. But right now, fluids seems like a, the big source of. Oh, so you're going that way and not in the necessarily in the direction of um, geometric analysis. See, I think we're still living in this golden age of geometric oh, yeah. analysis. Well, uh, I mean, personally, I'm moving more that direction, geometric oh, analysis. Yeah. Especially because a lot of my colleagues uh, are very strong in that here. Richard yeah. Jane and Jeff Fayaklovsky, Jeff Streets, and Shen Wen. Really right. Nice. Great people to talk to. So I'm I'm really moving more that direction. Um, especially this. Um, well, I I really uh, you know, would have if I had kept working in this, this direction, working on this um, Lagrangian mean curvature flow and these, these special uh, half dimensional. Sort of like oh yeah, I think there are a ton of very beautiful higher co-dimension stuff. Also, the special Lagrangian equation. Yeah, right, that's just something I'm thinking about actively. Absolutely, yeah. Very good. Uh, well, that's uh, that's very good. Uh, now, um, I don't know how many. Uh, yeah, I don't don't want to push. We'll probably wrap it up in just a few minutes. I'm okay, that, that's that, that's that's fine. I, you know what? The, what it ended up being is more. Um, I, I didn't intend this show to be like uh, exactly an interview. Um, uh -huh. It's it's perfectly fine. Uh, I was going to say if you have uh, questions for me or, or or something that I mean, but you did so well at answering um, my my questions about about your field and explaining it to uh, to this audience that uh, hopefully will I will have an audience. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. That. Uh, there wasn't a need, but um, well, I, I mean, just uh, well, thanks, thanks so, so much for for doing oh, that. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for. I mean, it's it's a joy for me to talk to a friend about mathematics in general. You know, it's a, it's a passion that I don't feel like I share with a lot of people because math is a small world. So any chance that we get to discuss it and hopefully make it accessible to a broader audience. No, thank you for making the venue to do it. Uh, well, I don't know if this will be a successful <laughs> venue, uh, but it's just it's something. That, yeah, I just want to have these uh, conversations. Uh, do you watch any shows, by the way, or, or on, on YouTube or uh, uh, um, pod, people's podcasts or something like that? No, I haven't. Haven't watched any. No, that's not your yeah. world. I guess I'm kind of uh, only in this world of uh, YouTube podcasts and uh, people I'm trying to emulate here, uh, uh -huh. people like Joe Rogan and Eric Weinstein and uh, this guy Lex Friedman. Right. Who, uh, they, talk, they talk to some scientists and all kinds of other people, interesting people. And sometimes I think, uh, I don't know, I want to talk to people, no, uh, no sensationalism, no, no bullshit, no, right. no bullshit on my show. <laughs> Although there might not be as exciting stuff on my show, so we maybe need to maybe add more uh, uh, sensationalism. Right, right. I'll, I'll alternate ones like the one we did today with more, uh, yeah, flashy, flashy stuff. So yeah. you don't know uh, uh, what those other uh, things are. I'm just I'm trying to capitalize, trying to do the same thing for myself. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? Anything? Uh, you want it then to uh, put out there? 
Oh no, no, I think uh... you don't have you don't have a, a show to plug. Yeah. <laughs> All right, a show to plug. No, no, I think just you know uh, keep, keep keep an eye out. There's there's big results on the way. Big results already. <laughs> Well, I've had this experience of some, you know, you as a young person, you, uh, you can claim that you have to, you have to back it up and, and that it'll all be good. Uh, sometimes these, uh, the big wigs mm -hmm. have their way of planting their flags on, on results. Right. Without, mm -hmm. without there being a proof and, uh, right. you know, it just, just becomes a fiasco. Yeah. Does that ever happen? I, I, I imagine. Uh, are there are there wrong results in your in your field? Oh, the, the, there are papers which publish incorrect uh, theorems. <laughs> there are. Is that uh... so? They, they they get published. They get through the pipeline sometimes, uh, but also they you know I think they they get caught too with good. Uh, High frequency. So. Oh, really? So, because I know, I mean, here you're in a very technical, hard field, but um, but everyone acknowledges that, and there's there's lots of attention to the kinds of things that you need to do in order to prove something, and and mm. you know what will allow you to verify that a, that a result is is really true, and that you you really added something. Yeah. Whereas it's easier to hide. You know, some in some of these other cases in, in geometry or, or um, I don't know, physics, some something where everyone knows they think they have the equation. They also think they know the answer. Yeah. So it's just a matter of someone claiming, "Oh, I've I've got it. I I'm the one who proved this this thing we all we all thought." Right. Where it, it, something can, you know, you're you're cheating somewhere. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, uh, I think that that there's a danger in mindset. For, well, I like to like have my goal. End goal is always being like finding the truth, whatever that is. Like for me, like what, what, what I believe is irrelevant until the truth is established. I think that disassociating oneself with a desire, or like a desired outcome, is very important for uh, for doing mathematics. I hope that to impart this to my students and people who work with me that uh, the truth is more important than what your hopes and beliefs are well i of course i agree people have been saying this you, you should be uh, dispassionate about science for a long time well i'm not sure being like i think one could still be passionate about a problem oh but yeah but it's different <laughs> like yes of course you know be very interested in the, the thing that you're doing and yet dispassion like um not uh what did you're not you you should be able to judge everything on its merits right not not to be convinced of, of one thing uh, too quickly that it's all about this or that and yet um i i think that the major obstacle do you think that the major obstacle to doing things in that you know with that proper mindset is uh either that is is that it's too easy to get caught up in one way of thinking and that people don't notice it, or or is it that the there's just the needs of career? No, oh, yeah, uh, I don't... that that uh, force people to you know to promote their own stuff, and they need to put out something. Yeah, this uh, I don't know. I, I think it's sort of a case by case thing. Because uh, for me, I'd say yeah, I I'd love to. Uh, you're just you all about. Uh, the truth, I can, I can carefully scrutinize my own thinking and all, all I want, but that, that's great to say if, if I have something to put out there and someone will uh, recognize it and, and maybe give me a job. When, when, when that's not the case, I'm under a lot of pressure to have uh, something. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's, it, jobs are a hard thing in this academic world. But I really think it's important no matter where someone is to, to have, I think, so as a colleague once told me, which I think is uh, a good point, is that a good problem, if you think about it, will lead somewhere interesting and publishable no matter what. So I think having the guidance at the beginning of career 
uh, to be guided, I said, the, the right guidance towards the right problems. Uh, and later on, the right tastes, choosing problems. So like, in a way that they're not zero-sum games. They're good problems that are, no matter what the truth you discover is, you write it down and it's good and you share it. This is the, what you're aiming for. Oh, that's, that's really good. Um, I think that's something uh, my own advisor uh, said, you know, well, well, he, <laughs> you know, if you were good, you'd find something. I think it's, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, uh, yeah. said. But um, I, I, yeah, there was, there were times when something was just, you know, I tried all the methods that I knew and then I eventually had to, it, it just took so long that I had to change, change the problem slightly in order to do something and uh, look, at, look at a different, it ended up being almost a different problem by the time I had uh, something I could actually, something I could actually say. Right, right. And the problem evolves. But if you're pointed in the right direction, the right area, then, uh, then yeah, then something is bound to be discovered. Mm. You know, so it was great. That yeah. That's a great way of looking at things and make it seem uh, possible. Yeah. All right, that's 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 really good. Uh, I think this was uh, this is good. I'll, I'll put it together. I'll, I'll show it to you, and uh, someday I'll have an actual uh, YouTube channel where the videos will be public. <laughs> and, I think that's awesome, Dan. I. I'll start watching the Dan podcast once it becomes available. And show. I, I haven't, yeah, I, it'll just be my name, I guess. I haven't thought of any better title. And Right, um, right. Well, if you think of a good title at some point. You know what, if, if you have a, even if you have a title, people don't call the show by its title. So oh, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't hear anyone calling things, uh, whatever they're called. No one, no one, never heard someone talk about, do you watch the, the Joe Rogan experience? Yeah, or the artificial intelligence podcast or whatever. Uh, so it'll just have to be my name. I was uh, thinking of keeping my name out of it because maybe I want to uh, keep it anonymous because it could hurt me what I have to say. <laughs> or, but I, I, I don't know. I think I'm screwed either way. Uh, great. So um, maybe we'll. Uh, do you have any other uh, kinds of interests that uh, you feel like uh, should be represented, represented on a show? Oh, I'll, I'll keep in touch about it for sure. And uh, I'm very open to the idea of appearing again on, uh, on another topic. Okay. Talked yeah. about uh, movies with some people. Great, great, great. Uh, thank you. You've, you've done the, the math world a, a great service here today, Connor. And you've been a fantastic host, Dan. I can't think of someone more <laughs> uh, well-suited to the job. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm trying to get there. Uh, I've been, this is my seventh time. Awesome. All right, good. Uh, right, Dan. I'll, I'll better sign off now. Yeah. It right. was a great seeing you, and let's talk again soon. Yeah. Okay, great. All, All right. right. Bye.